Good afternoon. We are so thankful that you joined us for another week of virtual chapel service at the on the OCU campus. Today we mark Maundy Thursday, the night in which Jesus gathered with his disciples for the Last Supper. This is a high and holy day in the Christian church, often marked with the gathering of the community for Holy Communion for themselves. If you are watching this on campus today and would like to partake in Holy Communion, we invite you to stop by outside the chapel on the quad. There will be a station for Holy Communion. You can also email Elizabeth Horton Ware to receive Holy Communion in your office. You'll just need to let me know where you are located so we can bring it to you sometime today. On Friday, Good Friday, the university closes at noon, and we will gather together for a short Good Friday service. This year, our tree planting service will be on the southeast corner of the administration building, where we will highlight uh, the, the events of Jesus' crucifixion, but also lean into hope as we mark new life through a new tree planted on our community campus. Next week, chapel service will include scriptures and songs to mark the holy day of Easter. You will want to join us as a variety of our campus musicians share their gifts, and we are led through the day's events of Jesus' resurrection. And that will be shared in our live preview format on Facebook and available on you, our YouTube channel afterwards. As always, if you're watching, we'd love to know where you are located and that you are joining us. And so if you will send the, or comment with a message, share where you are, we'd love to interact with you today. Friends, we also are looking forward to April 22nd, which will be our first in-person chapel service. We will finish up the semester with two weeks of in-person services, and we hope that will be a blessing to our community as we uh, are so thankful for this time of recovery for our communities, for our campus, for our world. May this week be holy and blessed for you. Amen. Please join us in the call to worship. Jesus calls us to the feast. We come ready to join his disciples at the table of grace. Jesus calls us to join him in love and service. We come ready to wash one another's feet. Jesus shows us how to love one another. We come ready to worship the God who calls us. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. God of Moses and Miriam, God of those who followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, God of all who call on you today, you delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, keeping them safe from harm as they ate the bread of affliction, 
seasoned with salty tears and bitter herbs. Today, you continue to hear the voices of all who live in fear and pain, offering them the bread of life and the cup of salvation as a promise to deliver them from despair and anguish. As we remember that last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, give us the courage to live as servants, to love the world as you have loved us, and to pour out our lives as members of the body of Christ. Amen. Our first scripture today comes from Exodus 12, 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel, on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join with its closest neighbors in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who can eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, one year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until four assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter them at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb the same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain in the morning. Anything that remains in the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign of you on your houses where you live. If I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today comes from John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 30. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. And he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants, are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. 
I am not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture, the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. After saying this, Jesus was very troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you were going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. This has got to be the best Passover meal I've ever had. Don't tell my mother that, though. <laughs> He's not kidding. This has been such a wonderful Passover spending it with Jesus, and it's always a special time for the Jewish people anyway. I don't know. I think it would have been better if I wasn't sitting next to Peter's stinky feet. <laughs> oh, boy! Jesus, maybe you should wash them again. <laughs> hey, you wish your feet smelled like mine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this really has been nice. My lord. I will tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Peter's looking at me like I'm supposed to know what's going on. But I have no idea. What does Jesus even mean by betray? Is someone in trouble? Well, I'll tell you one thing. None of these guys are going to ask. So I guess it's up to me. Jesus, who is it, my lord? Well, it's the one I will give this bread to after I dip it in this bowl. Do quickly what you're going to do. When I was a pastor in Mason City, Iowa, the Monday Thursday tradition was a play reenacting the Last Supper as depicted in Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the same name. As the members of the congregation came into the sanctuary, in the front of the church was a table, set as in the painting, and 13 men posed as Jesus and his 12 disciples, each in the posture of one of the characters in the painting. The play was a series of monologues as each of the disciples described his experience of following Jesus. At the time, I found the play a novel approach to Holy Thursday, since I have an appreciation of the arts in worship, drama, dance, visual arts, and a variety of music. Now, however, while I certainly still approve of the arts in worship, as the portion of Rebecca's play today indicates, I realized that the particular da Vinci depiction of the Last Supper left a lot out or rather left a lot of people out. Are we really to believe that only Jesus and his 12 male disciples would have been present at the Passover meal in Jerusalem? Think about your own cultural context for a moment. How many times have you been to a major religious or national holiday meal where the whole group gathered was a single gender and the same age? 
Now, this might happen for more personal events, such as birthday parties or bachelor bachelorette parties, but major religious holidays, as Passover is, are usually celebrated with extended family and friends, mixed gender, mixed age groups, except in COVID-19 year. So who then would have been around that table at that last supper some 30 years into the first century of the common era? Mark's gospel does seem to portray the meal as including only the 12 men whom Jesus chose as apostles. Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, James son of Zebedee, his brother John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, another guy named James, another guy named Simon, Thaddeus, and most infamous Judas of Iscariot. According to Mark, Jesus arrives at the upper room with these 12 men for the Passover Seder. Or perhaps others were already present, but Mark doesn't say anything about this. In the Gospel of John, however, the Last Supper is set the day before the Passover begins, and it does not specify who's joining Jesus for this meal, though a few people are named, Simon Peter, Thomas, Philip, and Judas. However, based upon the persons who are named in the gospel stories prior to this meal, as well as following it, we can likely broaden the circle beyond just the men Jesus explicitly calls as disciples in John's gospel. For example, in chapters 11 and 12, John names a family who are close to Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Although little is said about this family, we can make a few assumptions about them. First, the only male in the group is Lazarus, the one whom Jesus raised from the dead. He's introduced as Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This tells us a great deal. Since the village is described as of Mary and Martha, it's likely they were better known and perhaps older than Lazarus. And although some translations say a certain man, to introduce Lazarus, implying he was an adult, the Greek simply says a certain one, meaning a specific Lazarus that Jesus knew, not just anybody by that name. These introductory comments suggest to us that Lazarus might be a young person who is neither the main provider in the home nor married. He is also shortly thereafter called he whom Jesus loves, which I'll return to in a moment. Mary is mentioned next. She's the person who in John's gospel anoints Jesus' feet with an extravagant amount of ointment. Neither she nor her sister have husbands named, thus they are likely either uh, never have been married or they were widows, which often fairly young women by our standards might be at that time. Martha seems to be the oldest sibling, possibly the owner of the house in which they all live. Their parents are likely no longer living since they are not mentioned and the siblings are identified with the village rather than as the son or daughter of their father. The day following the Last Supper is when Jesus is crucified. John says that at the cross, the mother of Jesus, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene were also present. It's likely that Mary's husband Joseph is long since deceased since he does not appear in any of the gospels after the birth stories in Matthew and Luke. Hence, Mary with a 30 year old son is likely a 45 to 50 year old widow. Mary, the wife of Cleopas is also apparently married to a man named Cleopas. And Mary Magdalene gives, gains her surname from her village, Magdala. She was likely a person of some means though not likely from prostitution, as the church tradition suggests, but rather from fishing, which is what Magdala was well known for. Thus, there are a variety of persons in the scenes immediately preceding and immediately following the Last Supper who are likely dinner companions with Jesus and his disciples. There were likely other persons present as well, unnamed and unmentioned, such as slaves and servants who are part of the Jesus following group. We generally assume that all the disciples were age peers of Jesus. And indeed in the dramatic portrayal of the Last Supper in Mason City, all of the men playing the disciples were approximately the same age. 
But as we have just seen, there were likely women present of various ages and marital status. And we have good reason to believe there were younger people, youth, and maybe even children among Jesus' disciples. The disciple I want to focus our attention on at this point is an anonymous disciple described as the one whom Jesus loved. This person mentioned in our passage is an otherwise unnamed disciple. This one has often been called the beloved disciple. And there are a variety of theories about who this person might have been, including that this might be Lazarus, since he is also described as one whom Jesus loved. But rather than focusing on this disciple's identity, I want to focus on their age. The beloved disciple may well have been an older child or youth who came to believe in Jesus and followed Jesus as a disciple. Few scholars have, have discussed this possibility, but senior religious education major Rebecca Small argues this thesis in her capstone paper. The dramatic scene which you saw earlier in the service was a portion of a project related to that capstone. Rebecca makes several arguments for why the disciple whom Jesus loved could be considered a child. I wanna focus just upon two of these points, namely, Peter's prompting of the beloved disciple to ask Jesus about whom he was speaking when he said, one of you will betray me, and the posture of the young person in relationship to Jesus at the meal. Simon Peter takes it upon himself to volunteer the beloved disciple to ask Jesus who the betrayer will be. This scene is reminiscent of the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, where Peter's brother Andrew volunteers the lunch of a young boy as the food that might feed the crowd of thousands. Maybe Peter is across the room and he doesn't want to blurt out the question, though that would not be uncharacteristic for Peter. But maybe the one whom Jesus loved, who's described as leaning against Jesus' chest, is a child. It perhaps lessens the tension created by Jesus' pronouncement to have a child ask, who is it, rather than a question by one of Jesus' social equals, another adult male. The English translation we often use in chapel, the New Revised Standard Version, says that this disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining next to Jesus. The New International Version, another popular translation of the Bible, renders these same verses first using the word recline, as the NRSV does, but then just shifts to say the disciple was leaning back on Jesus. So first a note about meals in the ancient world. Rather than sitting up on chairs at a 28 inch to 30 inch high table, as is common for dining tables in the US today, the, in the ancient world, the table was low enough for people who were typically reclining on couches to be able to reach the table. The diners propped themselves up on one elbow and ate with the other. So reclining in and of itself does aptly describe what the dining experience was in the ancient world. The NIV's statement that the disciple was leaning back on Jesus is a bit hard to envision in this dining scene. Are we to think they were sitting back to back on the floor? Another translation helps us out more here. While, by, while students in OCU Bible classes know that the faculty rarely recommends the King James version of the Bible. In these verses from John 13, King James gets it right. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? The image this description conjures up for me is a grown-up lounging on a couch at a holiday meal, enjoying their food from an adjacent coffee table, and a younger person at the gathering snuggles up on the couch, putting their head on the grown-up's chest and proceeding to snitch food from the grown-up's plate. John's theology goes a bit deeper, however, than this playful image suggests. The word that the KGV translates in verse 22 as bosom or breast, which can also mean chest, is found once earlier in the gospel uh, of John's first chapter, verse 18, the end of the prologue. The last few verses of the prologue in the NRSV read, and the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, 
the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. I consider this to be John's version of the birth story of Jesus, akin to what we find in the Christmas stories at the beginning of the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. This phrase, close to the Father's heart, is similar to the language in the Last Supper in John. A more literal translation is, close to the Father's chest, or as the King James says, in the bosom of the Father. Of course, since the prologue is poetry, this is a metaphorical image describing the close familial relationship between God and Jesus. However, the language evokes for me the parent-child relationship that the terms father and son are pointing to as well. This is a place where we need to remove our ist glasses to be able to see the image more clearly. In this case, we need to remove our ageist glasses. Our default when we read about Father God and Son Jesus is an adult parent and an adult son. But John's gospel at this point considers us, invites us to consider a different image. The son who is close to the father's heart is the infant or child Jesus lying against the divine parent's chest. It is an image of God, the eternal parent, embracing the divine child. This image early in the gospel then allows us to view the scene with the disciple whom Jesus loved differently than our ageist glasses again often lead us. The disciple whom Jesus loved, who is lying against Jesus' chest at the Last Supper, evokes the image of the prologue of the divine child in the bosom of the divine parent. And thus, as Rebecca pointed out in her capstone paper, the disciple has a similar child to parent relationship with Jesus that Jesus has with God. This young disciple, though unnamed, is then a very significant person in the Gospel of John, which contains fewer child characters than the other Gospels do. If we are correct that the beloved disciple is an older child or youth, this would be the only child or youth explicitly called a disciple in the Gospels. Let's then go back to the Last Supper as John presents the scene to us. This dining the night before the Passover with his disciples. Jesus is with Peter and J Judas, Thomas and Philip. We know that Nathaniel was also a disciple and that likely the siblings from Bethany, Mary, Martha and Lazarus were also followers of Jesus. Mary and Lazarus might well be young people. John says that the next day at the cross, Jesus' mother, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene were also present. It's quite likely if they were at the cross, they were also at the supper the night before. Now we have a much larger scene than the one which is often put before us. In addition to Jesus' 12 uh, male disciples, we have at least three children or youth. We have at least four adult women, not to mention servants or slaves who may have been part of the entourage from Galilee or Bethany. Moreover, it would not be out of the realm of the possibility to consider that any of these women or male disciples may have had their own children accompanying them as well. Fast forward to 2021 Holy Thursday. A few of us might gather in churches for our Holy Week services. Many of us will still be experiencing the service remotely as we are today with chapel. But who is present at our gatherings? My hope is that our Holy Thursday services, however they are observed this year, look like the Last Supper in the Gospel of John, as John describes the room. Younger people, older people, mixed gendered group of people, and persons from a variety of economic, marital, social, and racial ethnic contexts. If that is not what it can be this year, let us make this our goal for 2020 so that our gathering reflects the popular hymn lyrics, draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please join me in an attitude of prayer. We begin our reenactment of the events of Jesus last night with the disciples, with this meal Jesus shared with them that night. As we prepare to come to Christ's table, let us come recognizing who we are. O oh Christ, in your presence, we discover who we are. You wash our feet, and we learn how reluctant we are to serve one another. Even as you prepare to give yourself for the sake of the world, we are still seeking promotions and possessions. Our love scarcely suffices the fulfillment and the requirements of good manners, and yet you invite us to eat at your table. Forgive us and help us to value your presence more dearly, that we may find this meal to be a celebration of joy. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power forever. Amen. Holy mystery, just as Jesus offered bread and wine, so that we might eat and drink, we offer these gifts to a world that is hungry for abundant life. Christ be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the Holy One. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is a right, good, and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give our thanks to you who saved the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and who continues to hear the voice of your people in times of trouble. We give you thanks for the gifts of life and love, for your promise to feed us with your holy word, and to make us into members of the body of Christ. And so with your creatures on earth and all the heavenly chorus, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and holy is your child, Jesus Christ, who walked among us from Galilee to Jerusalem, and who continues to live in us today, showing us your face in the faces of those whose feet you wash and in your power of love to heal all things. On the night in which he gave himself up, Jesus took bread, broke it, saying, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the healing of the world. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ to a world that is aching and yearning to be made whole. Teacher of truth, wellspring of love, source of compassion, we praise your healing, gracious name. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
with Moses and Miriam and all the disciples, let us go forth to kneel at the feet of all who cry out for help, offering our love and service on the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. <laughs> 